Hey guys, uh, so you know the deal. Uh, these next two weeks, you are not actually gonna be on campus, so I thought what I would do instead is I would actually record some videos of myself in the lab. And what we're gonna be focusing on for these two weeks is ion exchange chromatography. So at this point, you've probably already looked at the lecture regarding ion exchange chromatography, and we're just coming off the heels of doing size exclusion chromatography. One of the nice things about size exclusion chromatography is there's not really a whole lot that you have to be aware of. All you have to really be aware of is how big is your protein, what kind of resin are you going to use to appropriately separate it out from other proteins in your mixture. With ion exchange chromatography, it's a little bit different. Ion exchange chromatography is going to separate proteins on the basis of their electrical charge. Now, earlier in the semester, we had a good discussion about isoelectric points each protein has one. The isoelectric point is the pH at which that protein has a net neutral charge, meaning no electrical charge. Now, what we have to be aware of here is that tyrosinase, the protein that we're going to be trying to purify, is going to have a different isoelectric point than most of the other proteins in the mixture. And as such, we need to pick a pH to work at that is not only compatible with tyrosinase and will cause it to have a electrical charge, we also need to pick a resin that is going to work for it as well. Now, after doing some research and lecture, we discovered that Tyrosinase is predicted to have a isoelectric point of roughly 5.4 or so. So if we were to work at a neutral pH of 7, that would cause tyrosinase to be fairly negatively charged. That being the case, we have picked a resin called DEAE, which is a anion exchanger, meaning it is going to have a positive charge because it has a pKa of somewhere around 11 or 12. So 7 is much less than that. The resin is gonna be positively charged. Our protein is gonna be negatively charged. We want the two to interact. We're going to add our extract to the resin and our protein hopefully should get stuck to the column. Now, the thing we have to be aware of here that we did not have to be aware of with size exclusion chromatography is that depending on what kind of buffer we're using, we can absolutely disrupt the binding of tyrosinase to the column. And the main thing that's going to do that in disrupting its binding is salt. So because tyrosinase is negatively charged and it's binding to a resin that's positively charged, any salt that's in the buffer can potentially disrupt that interaction, meaning that the whole thing's not gonna work. Our tyrosinase right now is stored in sodium phosphate buffer, an ionic buffer, so that's not gonna work for us. The first thing that we're gonna have to do here is we need to use dialysis to exchange tyrosinase into a new buffer. You know how this works. The dialysis membrane has little microscopic pores big enough to let salt ions through, but not so big that tyrosinase is gonna get through itself. So it's the perfect thing to exchange the sodium phosphate buffer for something else. Now, the new buffer that we're going to use here is going to be TRIS. It is one of the most famous good buffers. It's non-ionic. It's not going to hopefully disrupt tyrosinase's ability to bind to the column and it should still serve as a good buffer in the range of seven to nine, which is where we've been wanting to work at all semester. It's the same sort of range that sodium phosphate buffer has. So what we're going to do first is we need to calculate how much tris that we're going to need for a 50 millimolar solution. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so let's figure out how much tris we need to make a 50 millimolar solution. Now this is the kind of solution that I could see us definitely using again, so we're gonna go ahead and make a whole liter of it. But the first piece of information that we specifically need is we need to know its molecular weight, which I have here. It's 121.14 grams per mole. And we know that we want to make a 50 millimolar solution. So we can write that as 50 millimoles per liter. 50 millimolars, 50 millimoles per liter. Okay, so let's go ahead and multiply by the molecular weight here. So we're gonna multiply by 121.14 grams per mole. Moles and millimoles can't quite cancel out here because it's not exactly the same unit. So let's apply a conversion factor. We need to know how many millimoles are in a mole. So one mole, is going to be equal to a thousand millimoles.
Okay, so we should have millimoles canceling out here, moles canceling out here. And since we know we're making one liter of this, we can just go ahead and cancel out liters, assuming we're multiplying by one liter to get that to cancel out. So what we're gonna get here is 6.057 grams. So just a little over six grams we need to weigh out. We're going to dissolve it in a little less than a liter of water, maybe seven or 800 milliliters. The thing we need to make sure we do here is we need to get the pH right. Something that we discussed in lecture is that in order to get the ion exchange chromatography to work as best as it possibly can, we need the pH to be right at about eight, which is a little more basic than how we've been working, but eight probably is going to work best. Now, Tris is a pretty, is a fairly uh, basic compound, so I would expect the pH of uh, the initial solution to be well above eight, so we're going to need to pH it down with hydrochloric acid to get it down to eight. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so off camera, I weighed out 6.057 grams of Tris base, which I have right here. I've got about 750 milliliters of distilled water with a stir bar in it and right next to the pH meter, which we are definitely going to need. So I'm gonna go ahead and add my Tris base here and we're gonna give it just a couple of minutes to get nice and mixed up. Uh, so once the video starts again, we will go ahead and pH this. All right, so the Tris has uh, dissolved nicely in solution and I've got the pH meter in there and you can see that as predicted, the Tris causes the water to be fairly basic. So we need to correct this and bring it down to 8.0. So that's going to require adding some of this. This is one molar, or it would be more appropriate to call it one normal hydrochloric acid. Now I could make this a quicker process by adding uh, concentrated hydrochloric acid, but that kind of has the downside of I could really overestimate how much I'm adding and go under 8.0. So we don't want that. We've got plenty of room for error here in terms of volume, so we're just going to keep adding uh, one normal hydrochloric acid until we get down to eight. So I'll be back once we get that done. All right, so I have added what feels like about a thousand gallons of hydrochloric acid, but we are finally there right at 8.00, which is exactly where we wanna be. Now, remember the idea here is that this is going to be our buffer that we not only store our tyrosinase in for this particular application, but this is also going to be our equilibration buffer for the DEAE resin. So that's gonna get the DEAE resin nice and positively charged so it will be ready uh, to bind to our tyrosinase. Now we're not going to use the whole liter here. We're going to sacrifice maybe about 50 milliliters of it for our dialysis. Uh, we'll use a little bit more for doing the dialysis again, and then we will save a little for uh, actually doing the ion exchange chromatography. We can always make more if we need to. It's not a big deal, not a hard thing to make. All right, so last thing that we're gonna do for the day, dialysis is an overnight process, so let's go ahead and put our fraction into dialysis tubing. All right, so we are ready to start the dialysis procedure. Now, dialysis membrane comes packaged uh, in kind of rolls like this. So typically what they'll have you do is just cut a length of dialysis tubing that you think you're gonna need. I've already done that. But the issue with dialysis tubing is that it is chemically treated for storage and basically holding a shelf life. And it's not gonna turn out well for us if we just stick our fractions, which you can see I've combined here together. So hopefully you'll forgive me for taking away the individuality of your groups. I thought it would be easier if we just do the dialysis all in one, but the dialysis tubing, because it's chemically treated, we don't wanna just launch right into putting our samples in. So what I've done is I have uh, treated the dialysis tubing uh, using a protocol that I've posted on Blackboard, so you should take a look at that. Uh, basically, I boiled it for 10 minutes in a solution of sodium bicarbonate and EDTA. So that's gonna, uh, without getting into the details, that's going to take away a lot of the chemicals that would uh, potentially inactivate or harm our protein. So what I'm gonna do here, this requires a lot of manual dexterity, which I don't necessarily have a whole lot of, so you'll have to bear with me here. So what I have here is I have dialysis clamps. So I have two of them because we're going to want to clamp both the top and the bottom. We've got to clamp the bottom before we can put anything in. 
So I am going to pull our dialysis tubing out of here, and of course it's going to try to escape from me. So here it is. Things are gonna be kinda of wet here for a second. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clamp the bottom. I have to be careful about doing this properly, and I'm gonna to try to keep this in view of the camera. Like I say, dexterity can be a little bit of a problem. Give me just a second here. I'm going to do this off camera. All right, there we go. Uh, I clamped it up a little higher than I meant to. Actually, let me try to fix that real quick. That's actually going to be kind of a problem. There we go, that's a little better. So the bottom is clamped off, so now we can go ahead and put our solution in the rest of it. So it's gonna be kind of hard to see, but I can kind of twist this so that you can see there's actually kind of a space in between the membrane. So got our sample here. I am going to go ahead and pull up all of it, which is a little more than six milliliters. So let me do this here so you can see it. Okay, and we are just going to, I'm gonna make a mess since I only have one set of hands here. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just going to try to work this into there. That did not work, I dropped it. Come on now. See, this is why if you have dexterity, you need to get into laboratory science because it can be kinda of hard working in a laboratory if you don't have any dexterity, like I don't. Okay, I finally got it in there. Whoa. So we're gonna go ahead and start filling that up there. Perfect. Uh, it would seem I judged uh, the length of the tubing just right, and of course we are getting leaking down here. So that's kind of a problem. Let me fix that real quick and then I'll be right back. All right, so I believe I've got the leakage problem fixed. It's a shame we lost maybe about two or 300 microliters of sample, so not a huge deal, but you never wanna lose sample if you can avoid it. So what we're gonna do here is we want to clamp right up here. We don't want to clamp so that there's no air in there because the air is going to actually help maintain a little bit of buoyancy. So I'm going to clip just a little bit above here get it there we go so there's a little bit of air trapped in there but that's actually good that buoyancy is going to help us with the whole process here so what we're going to do is we're going to drop it into this beaker that has about 500 milliliters of tris in it so it's going to maintain just like that and then we are going to put it in the cold room and we are going to spin it so that this whole dialysis process can happen at four degrees so we can keep our proteins nice and happy and in the meantime I'm gonna find something a little better to actually maintain buoyancy here so I may have to tape uh, the top part of that uh, dialysis tubing to the top of the beaker so I'll figure out a way to do that and I'll show you once I have it running all right so what I have done here which I think is a kind of clever is I skewered the top of the dialysis membrane with a uh, thermometer probe you can see it right there and that is suspending the dialysis membrane in the beaker, but it's not touching the bottom. I've got our stir bar down here, keeping everything nice and mixed up. So this is just gonna stay here in the fridge overnight, and tomorrow I will come and exchange it for some fresh uh, Tris base. We'll let that go another night, and then after that, we should be all ready to go to start our ion exchange chromatography. I will see you next time, okay?